Eoplasia. Let's talk about it. So the definition of neoplasia is the formation of a neoplasm. Pretty self-explanatory. A neoplasm is a tumor. It's any new and abnormal growth, specifically one in which cell multiplication is uncontrolled and progressive. They can be benign or malignant. So these are cells that proliferate. They grow and grow and grow, and we're not able to control them, <clears throat> and they'll continuously grow. They're quite progressive. Benign is an unusual growth of cells that do not destroy surrounding normal tissue. They can impair tissue function just by their presence, and they won't metastasize. So benign, if we think our most common example of a benign neoplasm would be a lipoma. So it's a tumor made up of lipocytes that has proliferative growth, so they're continuously growing. It's uncontrolled. Some of those big lipomas can become 9 pounds, but they won't go into normal surrounding happy tissue and invade it and destroy it. However, they can encroach on daily function. So that dog that I told you about earlier in the semester who had the 9 pound li lipoma on its neck, on the ventral aspect of its neck, that lipoma, because of its size, was impeding the, the function of the tissue around it. Okay, so it was, because of its presence, it was impeding function of normal tissue. It wasn't metastasizing to normal tissue, and it wasn't attacking normal tissue. Malignant cells that displayed uncontrolled growth and are capable of destroying local tissue. Metastasis is how cancer cells spread from the site of the primary tumor to secondary locations. So sometimes you'll hear this term, of, generally we're talking about can we're always talking about cancer, so has it metastasized? Are there METs in the lungs? If you ever hear somebody say, are there METs in the lungs, and they're looking at a radiograph, we're talking about metastasis. Are there signs of metastasis of another tumor into the lungs? The lymph nodes and the lungs are really common places for tumors, for neoplasms to metastasize to. But is it cancer? So in our human culture, we hear the term cancer so often. Cancer is everywhere. Everybody's always talking about cancer. Everybody's always trying to raise funds for cancer. We all know somebody who's been affected by cancer. So what the heck is cancer? Cancer is uncontrolled growth of cells on or within the body. Other terms used for cancer include tumor, mass, neoplasm, and growth. So cells that would not normally necessarily be present. So is it cancer? Yeah, it's cancer. And cancer is referring to benign or malignant. So when we say, I've got cancer, yeah, it's a bad thing. But what you really, I want to know in my head is, is it malignant cancer? Is it benign? Is it going to spread? Um, if it's malignant, you start to get an idea of how bad that type of cancer is. Benign cancers, yes, they can be very, very bad. They can cause a lot of function uh, disability, so disability of various functions of the body just based on their presence, but they're not a malignant cancer that has the potential to metastasize. So when we talk about cancer, I'm talking about both malignant and benign. Cytology, so this will all depend what it is that you're sampling. Is it a superficial lesion? Is it a mass inside the abdomen? Is it a lymph node? What the heck are you sampling? Based on what you're sampling, you have to choose the appropriate method to sample. Fine needle aspirate from cutaneous tissue masses and lymph nodes is common. And bone marrow aspirates are indicated when blood cell, so peripheral blood abnormalities, are seen. So FNB, aspirate, and non-aspirate. Best for cutaneous and soft tissue masses, as well as lymph nodes. Biopsies, best for cutaneous and soft tissue masses. Bone marrow aspirate or bone marrow core, again, it's when peripheral blood is indicating abnormalities. Here's an FNA on an enlarged lymph node. If you have an animal that has more than one enlarged lymph node, it's important that each, if possible, be sampled because that one large lymph node, we'll talk about this when we talk about um, lymph nodes in particular as a topic, but one gigantic lymph node 
might not actually be the best one to sample. It might have a necrotic center, it might have hemorrhagic center, so it might not be the most ideal lymph node to sample. Do sample the big one, but <clears throat> don't just focus on the biggest one. Sample all the enlarged lymph nodes, and sometimes it's recommended as well to sample the non-enlarged lymph nodes. This is a bone marrow aspirate. So growing, uh, this one is from the pelvic bone and the students will talk about this as part of their group project, so we won't go into much detail. Stains, again, it's going to be dependent on what the suspicion is. If it's suspected to be a mast cell tumor, which is a form of neoplasia, then numethylene blue would be most ideal. Otherwise, oftentimes we use Romanowski-type stains, and then send to the lab, and they can go ahead and use a papanipal. Uh, Papa Nicolau stain to confirm presence of abnormalities within the nucleoli. Histopathology is so important when neoplasia is suspected. So we use cytology as a preliminary approach to identifying abnormalities. The definitive diagnosis comes from histopathology. So it comes from tissue being sent to the lab and the labs that be able to identify which cells they're seeing and more specifically, how those cells are interacting with the tissue around it. So samples are larger than with cytology, right? With cytology, we're looking at a quick little snapshot, kind of like one little suburb in an entire city. Histopathology is looking at the entire city. Any mass that's removed should be submitted for histopathology. This will give a definitive diagnosis and subsequent treatment options. Sometimes clients don't want to send it. Don't judge them for that. Never, ever, ever judge them for that. If you have a 14-year-old cat and you're removing a lump and you know that you're not able to afford cancer treatment regardless, I understand why they don't want to find out what it is. You sit with a lot more guilt once you know that it's a malignant form of cancer than you would, per se, if you just don't send it away and don't necessarily find out. So just keep that in mind. There's always reasons that people don't send out their samples. Please don't judge clients based on it. Everybody has their own reasons and their own um, decision-making process. Results aren't as immediate as with cytology. It takes a little while for them to come back and it does determine a treatment and prognosis. So most often when you get a lab report back from histopathology, they'll identify what they're seeing in great detail and then what the animal's prognosis is based on the staging of the tumor and possible treatment options. So going back to this fabulous chart that you all love so much, it's so exciting. We've got infection, inflammation, neoplasia, non-inflammatory, non-neoplastic. So note in the neoplastic category, we have three types <clears throat> of subclassifications of neoplasia. That, oh no, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so keep that in mind. <clears throat> the tumor types that we're going to talk about are epithelial cell tumors, round cell tumors, and spindle cell tumors. Spindle cell tumors are also called mesenchymal tumors. And this is a good chart to get to know. So looking at the three different types, we have common characteristics to each type. We talk about them in regard to size, cell size, cell shape. Uh, there's a schematic representation, so drawings of each. Cellular cellularity of aspirates and clumps or clusters common. Epithelial cells. So they typically are pretty big cells. That being said, it depends what type of epithelial cell we're looking at. So we've talked about basal cells. You can have basal cell carcinomas, and you can also have squamous cell carcinomas. The size, between, the size difference between a squamous cell and a basal cell is quite significant. So the cell itself is going to change depending on the type of epithelial cell present. General cell shape, it's round to caudate. Again, your squamous cells are going to have a little bit more variation in their cell shape compared to your cute little basal, basal cells. Cellularity tends to be high, so uh, epithelial cells tend to exfoliate fairly well. Likewise, epithelial cells tend to be present in clumps or clusters, especially younger epithelial cells, <coughs> excuse me, like basal cells. I was saying that when we first talked about skin, basal cells have a lot of adhesion to each other. So when they exfoliate or when they're removed from their happy little tumor house, they exfoliate in clumps or clusters. So you'll see them in sheets. Not uncommon. Normal. For any skin cell. Or sorry, for any uh, basal cell in general. 
doesn't have to be cancer to be seen in sheets. Mesenchymal cells. So they're small to medium in size. They're spindle to stellate in shape. And the spindle can change. Sometimes they can have an oval nucleus. Sometimes they have a round nucleus. Depends on where they're found and the process from, uh, of retrieval from the body. Cellular Cellularity of aspirates is normally low, so they adhese well to each other, and they have a low rate of exfoliation. Clumps and clusters are not common with these cells. So if we're seeing clumps and clusters, it's an abnormal sign. Discrete or round cells are small to medium. They're round in shape, self-explanatory. Cellularity of aspirates is usually fairly high, and clumps or clusters are not overly common. Epithelial tumors. These tumors involve the skin itself, glands in the skin, or the hair follicles. They tend to be fairly round in shape, and the cells are attached to one another in sheets or clumps. That is most specific to young epithelial cells. Again, as they get older, they don't have the adhesion to each other, so they tend not to be seen in, shape, in sheets and clumps, and they tend not to be quite as round as they once were. The nuclei are generally round to oval in shape, and the cells have a distinct cytoplasmic border. Neoplasias that would fit within this would be papillomas, squamous cell carcinomas, basal cell tumors, sebaceous gland tumors, sweat gland tumors, perianal tumors, and transitional cell carcinomas. Transitional cell carcinomas are not uncommon. Um, we typically see them related to the bladder and the urinary tract. Squamous cell carcinoma is common to see them. Uh, horses get them fair, not terribly often, but you can see them on horses in the eye and on the general uh, superficial skin as well. And squamous cell tumors you can also see in the mouth in dogs too. Not uncommon. Not a great picture, um, but this is benign epithelial cells. So looking at their nuclei, they look fairly similar. They have, so as cells get older, as epithelial cells get older, their cytoplasm gets bigger, but their nucleus should get smaller. And these are more or less following that rule. There's a superficial cell. Okay, so their nuclei across the board, they look fairly similar. They're staining differently, but I don't use staining as any sort of criteria of malignancy because staining is completely dependent on the individual who stained it. And this, on the other hand, is dis uh, displaying signs of malignancy. So looking at it, we've got big cells, really big epithelial cells. And what I just said is that as they get older, they get bigger and their nucleus should start to shrink. Well, these are epithelial cells where they've gotten quite large and their nucleus is staying quite large. So that's quite abnormal. They also have lots of nucleoli, which isn't necessarily a criteria of malignancy. But changes in shape and size of the nucleoli could be a criteria of malignancy. So here we have one large nucleoli and a small nucleoli. That becomes a problem. That becomes a concern. This one is angry, very malignant looking. Having a look at it, a, it's very, very dark staining. Sometimes that can relate to malignancy, but again, it could be dependent on how they were stained. So it's not really reliable in that sense. But what we have here, again, we have all sorts of sizes of, of epithelial cells with their nuclei changing in shape and size as well. So the nuclei should go smaller as the epithelial cells get bigger. In this case, they are not. Again, you have high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio in this guy here. This cell has two nuclei. And if we look, it has one big nucleoli and one small nucleoli. This cell here has some abnormal mitosis occurring. Okay, so we're getting all sorts of uh, variants of these cells. There's lots of discrepancies between these cells. They don't look like one consistent type of cell. And again here, furthermore, we have more squamous cells that are displaying criteria of malignancy. So abnormal shapes and sizes and nuclear patterns. So mesenchymal tumors, we'll move on from epithelial cells into mesenchymal tumors, start from cells these cells start from cell, these tumors, sorry, start from cells that surround or support the skin. Fat, connective tissue, blood vessels, and nerves are common types of mesenchymal tissue. 
Cells of mesenchymal tumors often have poorly defined cellular membranes, especially when compared to uh, epithelial tumors. And cells are not typically round, unlike epithelial cells and round cell tumors. They tend to be spindle-shaped, or i.e. tapered at both ends. They can be polygonal or dendritic in shape. They often are loose and not in sheets or clumps, so they exfoliate on their own rather than in sheets, sheets or clumps. Examples, these are, we have a lipoma, fibrosarcoma, and hemangiosarcoma are examples of mesenchymal tumors. This is a hemangiosarcoma. Hemangiosarcoma and a hemangioma. Hemangioma is the benign form. Sarcoma is the malignant. And these are cells that are involved with blood vessels, so vasculature. Really common to have hemangiosarcomas on the spleen in dogs, especially big dogs, can get hemangiosarcomas on the spleen as they get older. Cats can get, can get them as well, so can uh, small dogs too. They can also get hemangiosarcomas anywhere that a blood vessel is formed. So you can see cutaneous hemangiosarcomas, you can see them uh, shifting into the bone, you can see them all throughout the body. And this is a lipoma. See, these are happy little adipocytes, fat cells, just kicking around, stuck to one another. Fat cells tend to be the exception to the rule where I said that mesenchymal cells don't typically exfoliate with other cells. So with that, mesenchymal cells, normally you, don't, you just see a few. You don't see heavy sheets of them if it's benign, except for lipocytes. Lipocytes hang out with friends. They always exfoliate with their buddies. And here's an osteosarcoma, so again, another type of spindle cell, mesenchymal cell tumor. Then we have round cells, also called discrete cell tumors. Round, um, I don't know why that word is there, but that's okay. <laughs> Included in this category are mast cell tumors, lymphoma, lymphosarcoma, histiocytomas, melanoma, plasmacytomas, histiocytic neoplasia, transmissible venereal tumors. Now, I said melanoma. However, melanoma needs to be inserted into every single category because melanoma is really interesting and very different than one particular category of cells. So melanoma could be an epithelial type tumor. It could be mesenchymal and it could be round cell as well. It completely depends on where the melanocyte came from in the first place. So they tend to be shape shifters. They tend to shift to suit uh, whichever tissue they're developing within. So yes, melanoma is noted under round cell, but just make sure you know that melanomas actually belong to any type of the three categories. So here's a typical round cell neoplasia. Lots of round cells. <laughs> lots of round cells. Lots of nucleus. Not a lot of cytoplasm. These are looking likely more toward lymphocytes. Here's another example. This is a mast cell tumor. They also belong to round cell neoplasia. Mast cell tumors have a grading system in place for the degree of malignancy. A lot of time mast cell tumors can be benign and they'll just get one little lump, doesn't come back, it's fine, that's it, benign uh, mast cell tumor. However, you can get malignancy in mast cell tumors as well and this is where it becomes quite deadly for animals. So in order to grade them, or in order to identify the degree of malignancy, they have to be graded. Grade 1 is well differentiated, generally well def defined, superficial, low mitotic index. Grade 2 moderately well differentiated, moderate to poorly circumscribed edges, mild to moderate infiltration into deep dermal tissues, moderate mitotic index, potential slight cytomorphological atypia. Grade 3, potentially poorly differentiated, poorly circumscribed, deep infiltration into subcutaneous tissue, potential high mitotic index, potential moderate cytomorphological atypia. This is done by histopathology. So this is why when you're, not us, but when the veterinarian is removing a tumor from the skin or from tissue of any sort, they need to ensure that they acquire good margins. So adequate margins. And what that means is that the tumor's in the middle and they're taking healthy tissue away around the tumor. They want to ensure that when they send it to histopathology for analysis, that the histopathologist can, can conclude that yes, the margins are clear, Okay, so you don't have any secret little cancer cells kicking around in those healthy looking margins. Or no, the margins are not clear and you have to go in and take more out. That being said, if it's a highly infiltrative lump or lesion, then they can 
those cancer cells can migrate to those margins and carry on to infiltrate healthy tissue. So viewing the margins is a really big part of histopathology. And that's why, if you ever wonder, uh, when you're involved in a lump removal on an animal, if it is malignant or suspected malignant, the veterinarian will definitely take out fairly large margins around the actual lump. So the lesion or the area that has been removed is a lot bigger than that tiny little lump, and the clients need to know that ahead of time as well. This is the transmissible venereal tumor, and it's super cool. I think it's super cool. This is the world's, one of the two world's oldest cancers, oldest living cancers, and it has stayed around for an exceptional period of time. It's also a transmissible cancer. So each animal that gets this on their face or on their genitals can touch it to another animal, say, tag you're it, now you have cancer, and move on their way. It's really unfortunate. Uh, the other one that belongs to this family is the devil facial tumor disease, and that's in Australia, in Tasmania, and wherever else. Well, it's just Tasmania, Tasmanian devils. But it occurs naturally there, and they, they've had huge impact on their Tasmanian devil population because of this tumor, this transmissible venereal tumor disease. So I'm just going to go back to it and talk about it a little bit more. Very common to find transmissible venereal tumors in tropical areas, or subtropical areas, areas that are warm pretty much all year round. And you'll start to see it in areas that have high wild dog populations. So anywhere in the tropics that you might go for spay neuter, that you might go to help out, help vaccinate, etc., you will come in contact with transmissible venereal tumors. And they're extremely detrimental to the animals themselves. They do need to be treated with chemo. Um, and I suppose I'll talk about it a little bit more when I show you pictures of what they unfortunately do to the animals. So this is another example of a round cell tumor. This is a histiocytoma. It can be benign or it can be malignant, and there are various forms of histiocyte-based tumors. Histiocytes look similar to lymphocytes, but they have more cytoplasm. They have nice round purple nuclei, who knew? And they're all fairly uniform in shape and size. This is common for histiocytoma presentation. Histiocytomas typically look as little buttons, so sort of raised but flattened little balls on the skin. Very common to get them on the legs and the abdomen of dogs. And they're alopecic, so little raised red alopecic buttons. Another form is cutaneous histiocytosis, where it's Mo it's generalized throughout the skin, cutaneous histiocytosis. And then we have systemic histiocytosis, which creates lesions in soft tissue all throughout the body. Okay, this poor dog has it around the eyes and then around the nose. This one in particular is common to Bernese Mountain Dogs. And just going back to this one, uh, this is where it gets more severe, the, the systemic histiocytosis. This is where the animal is in quite a bit of pain chronically, and these histiocytic lesions are eating away at various areas in their body. And then this is another weird one that we came across. It's extremely strange. It makes the dog, I've only seen it in dogs, look like a cartoon character. My parents' dog, Fergie, had it, and she's a little beagle cocker spaniel cross. The end of her nose looked exactly like this dog's nose. And of course, my parents, you know, they had reason why it happened. It's because she's eating chicken. I swear it's because she's eating chicken. So they switched her to lamb and rice and it magically went away. But then it came back. Oh, we must have given her a chicken treat, that kind of thing. So they had a reason for why it was happening, but that wasn't really the reason why it was happening. It was something that they were, they could at least make sense of, or they were trying to make sense of it. And it would come and go. It would get really, really big, quite significant, and then disappear on its own without any treatment. So one day it got really big and we brought her to Seneca and we did some x-rays to see if it was a proliferative lesion that might be eating away at the bone of her nose. We x-rayed it, looked normal, okay, just looked like soft tissue mass on top of her nasal bone. And then we did a finding, or no, we didn't, we did a punch biopsy and took out a nice little core sample, sent it away for histopathology, and it came back as a histiocytic lesion, simply a histiocytic lesion, benign not malignant, not going to spread anywhere. And guess what? After we took that little punch biopsy out, 
or that little core sample out by punch biopsy, it never came back. So I'm happy to say I cured it by doing a punch biopsy. I know it's it's hard to believe, but it didn't come back. And we've seen other cases of this. Uh, we've looked it up on various vet information networks. It exists. It's a bit strange, totally benign, um, and not quite sure why it's happening. But it's interesting, and maybe you'll come across it in your lifetime. Okay, naked nuclei. I talked a little bit about naked nuclei when we were talking about backgrounds. Just note, naked nuclei, if you have a lot of them on your field, you probably should get another sample, especially when it comes to lymph node aspirates or anything you're suspecting as a lymphoma, because those cells are in particular quite fragile. So if you have a lot of naked nuclei, get a new sample. They are not diagnostic. However, sometimes it's common for certain types of cells to rupture as you're taking them out, like the thyroid cells that I was talking about in the previous lecture. So the naked nuclei, always, you know, if you're looking for criteria of malignancy, if you're looking to identify a sample as neoplastic, make sure that you're only looking at cells that actually have an intact cytoplasm and nucleus. Okay, really, really, really important. These are naked nuclei. So you might have the occasional cell with cytoplasm, but in general, you have a ton of naked nuclei. So you could not make any guesses as to what this is specifically based on naked nuclei alone. Thyroid tumor, those are the ones where it's extremely common to get naked nuclei because of the fragility of those cells when you're extracting them. Doesn't mean that you can make any sort of definitive, um, dis, um, dis definitive conclusion, that's the word I'm looking for, to, to identify that, yes, these are thyroid tumor cells. However, if they're coming from the thyroid area and you're getting a lot of naked nuclei, you would write that down as that might be a criteria that's considered in the diagnos diagnostic process. Okay, so there's a bit of a name game in regard to naming neoplasms. The prefix of a tumor's name indicates tissue of origin. So example, osteosarcoma, osteo bone. The suffix usually, not always, usually indicates benign or malignant. So if it's just plain old oma, it's benign, like fibroma, benign tumor of fibrous connective tissue. Sarcoma and carcinoma are malignant. So if it says fibroma, benign, fibrosarcoma, malignant tumor of fibrous connective tissue. They're classified, classified by their tissue of origin. Carcinomas typically typically refer to epithelial cell tumors. They spread through, the, the, through both the lymphatic system and the bloodstream, i.e. these are very, they, they have high chance of metastasis. And regional lymph node and lung metastasis are common. That's what I just said. <laughs> okay, so carcinomas, epithelial tumors. Sarcomas are mesenchymal or spindle cell tumors. They spread through the bloodstream, but they don't metastasize to the lymph nodes. Or they do, they can, it's extremely rare. Here's a round cell tumor, and it's a mast cell tumor in particular. Here we have spindle cells, so mesenchymal type tumor, lots of spindle shaped cells kicking around. And here is an epithelial type tumor. So more of a defined cytoplasmic border, common to epithelial cells. And this one would, uh, I'm not sure, this one's probably malignant. This one has a lot of criteria of malignancy, which we'll talk about next. Tumor tracking, so grading, in order to help predict tumor behavior and prognosis, we do this thing called grading. It's defined micro microscopically on histopathology. Low grade is well differentiated tissue structure, slow cell division, minimal tissue invasion of normal tissue. High grade is undifferentiated tissue structure, rapid cell division, lots of mitotic figures, and aggressive invasion of normal tissue. Staging is done by the veterinarian according to the physical characteristics of the tumor and diagnostic test results. So their mnemonic for remembering it is TNMN. So T is the features of the tumor at the primary site. N is the regional 
lymph node involvement. M is metastasis. And then it's staged uh, on a numerical scale, identifying is it low grade or high grade. So low grade lymph node involvement or high grade. Low grade metastasis or high grade. I'm not too concerned about you knowing this in particular. This is more just another thing to be aware of that it exists as a form of tracking tumor progression. As an RVT, you definitely should be aware of this. Early warning signs for cancer. So any signs that an animal's not doing well, truly almost any, any abnormal body sign could be a sign of cancer, but it becomes more of a concern when they're persistent and recurrent. Abnormal swelling that persists and grows, sores that don't heal, weight loss, loss, loss of appetite or difficulty eating or swallowing, bleeding or discharge from body openings, offensive odor coming from an area, persistent lameness and stiffness, hesitation to exercise slash loss of, loss of stamina, difficulty urinating, breathing, or defecating. So these are very broad. They could be um, other symptoms or they could relate to other medical conditions as well that aren't specifically cancer. So don't jump the gun and assume that your cat has persistent swelling, it's cancer, end of the world. But these are common in cancer patients. That being said, if they're persistent or recurring, the red flags go up a little bit. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is create two separate PowerPoints, one of which is malignancy versus benign, which you've just watched. Uh, no, I'm not. Ignore that. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Okay, criteria of malignancy. So how do we tell if the cells that we're seeing are looking malignant, i.e. bad, or benign, which is still bad, but not as bad. So it's still not ideal, but it's not as scary as a malignant tumor would be. So when we're looking at our cytology, we need to look for these things called criteria of malignancy. And they're div d divided into nuclear and general forms. Nuclear forms are the best, they're the most irrefutable. They require between three to five criteria before commenting on suspected malignancy. Three if you're using nuclear criteria alone. You have to use representative and intact well-stained cells, so don't base these criteria on naked nuclei. When reporting, always, always, always include suspected. So if you are reporting that you think you're seeing a malignant sample, so you're looking at it and you're going, oh no, Oh no, what are these cells? These aren't looking very good. These are looking really malignant. And you're going through this whole sad thought process in your head. Just be sure when you write it down on paper, you say suspected malignant blah, 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 blah. So suspected malignant epithelial cells. We can't diagnose it. Even with cytology alone, we truly can't diagnose it. It needs to go to histopathology. So we always say suspected. This sheet is in your Dropbox, I believe. No, nope, you don't have Dropbox. Blackboard. Blackboard is where you'll find it. And it has all the criteria of malignancy that we're going to look at in class. So we have general criteria, which refers to the cell as a whole. So the general shape and size of the cells. And then we have all these very specific nuclear criteria. And I want you to look through this prior to lab and we'll start getting an idea of criteria of malignancy. So this is one example of criteria of malignancy would be an increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio for that type of cell. And just keep in mind when you're gauging it, you have to consider the size of the cell and its ratio to nucleus. So in this case, we have a bigger nucleus, yes, but compared to its friend, the ratio of nuclear to cytoplasm has not changed. Okay, The cell size has changed, but the ratio hasn't changed. Here, on the other hand, you can see here's our happy little normal guy. And then here you have a giant cell, but you also have a gigantic nucleus. So that ratio of nuclear to cytoplasm has changed. It's shifted. Okay, likewise, if this is normal, then this one is increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Macronucleoli determining factor are if the nucleoli are greater than 5 micrometers. So that could mean about the size or bigger of a red blood cell for nucleoli. 
Pleomorphism is one of the most um, one of the most irrefutable malignant traits in cells. So it's one of the most important ones that we see that right away things are starting to look really crummy to us based on pleomorphism. And pleomorphism is a change in size and shape of the same cell. So the same cell type, sorry. So change in size and shape of the same cell type. We'll look at pleomorphism as we start looking at criteria malignancy. It's a really important one to get to know. Anisocytosis, these ones are also undergoing a bit of pleomorphism, but anisocytosis as well, so differences in size of the same cell shape. And then we have other criteria like this. This is nuclear molding. So you have two nuclei that are attached within one cell. Same as over here. And then here we've got very clear increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Here we have borderline. This nucleoli is getting pretty big. It's not quite the same size as the RBC. So it's not quite macronucleoli yet. Same with that one. It's quite getting there. Okay, there's the other example of nuclear molding. So two nuclei within the same cell that are lumped on top of each other. They always remind me of Rolou formation in the horse because sort of one takes on the shape of the edge of the other. So these are all criteria of malignancy that we're going to look for um, in suspected malignant samples. Okay, again, mitotic figures, that's a big one. So it's abnormal mitosis, which tends to happen when cells are rapidly, rapidly dividing. And then here, too, you have nuclear molding happening again and there. So these cells that I've showed you are looking very malignant. So the more reliable uh, criteria of malignancy are the nucleoli that are different sizes in the same cell. Multinucleation, the nuclei displaying anisocaryosis, and striking cellular anisocaryosis. Less reliable, prominent or multiple nucleoli. Okay, lots of nucleoli. Doesn't necessarily mean it's malignant. If they're different shapes and sizes, yeah, that's a bit more concerning. Multinucleation displaying all nuclei as the same size, and normal mitosis. So seen in, in rare numbers in the same sample. Less reliable versus more reliable. So before you, we have lab on criteria malignancy, we probably won't for a little while still, but just get to know the criteria malignancy in detail so that you can take this knowledge, bring it to class, and we can start looking through samples and picking them apart.